Lord a hand clap of praise, family. Amen, amen. Can we give each other some love this morning? Amen, amen. It's so good to see everybody this morning. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. Amen. Oh, man, I am so excited to be with everyone this morning. You guys look amazing, amen? <laughs> okay. Hey, well, at least one person believes they look amazing, amen? Amen. You guys look amazing, amen? Amen. How many people know the Lord is truly good? That's not just something that we say. It's a revelation. Father, I just pray that as you speak today, as I allow you, that we would begin to receive revelation. Thank you for the healing that you're going to do as we mix faith with what we're hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing based upon what Christ has done. So we just receive today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Father wants to heal the divided heart. Father wants to heal the divided heart. Um, I start this message today, guilty as charged. <laughs> Sometimes as a leader, I can forget that the message comes to me first as truth so that I will respond in grace with humility Amen. that grace and humility would be imparted into us so I don't stand today as someone who has it all together I stand as someone who has been guilty as charged but who is being transformed by grace Amen, Amen. Amen. God wants to heal the divided heart Amen? Amen if you have your Bibles this morning if you could turn to Exodus chapter 20 I believe this is the word of the Lord. There are too many confirmations already that's letting me know this is the direction that Father is sending us today. Amen? Amen. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Me and Noah were in the office reading this this morning. Amen? And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Yeah. yeah. I am the Yahweh, your Elohim. But I, I'm not just telling you about my character and my nature. Yahweh, the self-existent, the eternal, yeah. the one that exists apart from everything. I didn't create creation because I needed something. I was already complete before I created anything. Yeah. Creation is an, is an expression of my love, not of my need. Mm. Mm. That's good. Yeah. How can I be God and create something that I need? Because if I create something that I need, I no longer am God. I am need. And if I have a need, that need coexists within me, not in something that I do or something that I say. Need is something that I am. So when I express things, I'm expressing who I am, not because I need you to respond, but I want you to respond because even if you don't give me worship, I'm good because I am worship. I am the Lord, your God. But what did I do? I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Why? 
Could they bring you up out of Egypt? Could they bring you out of the land of slavery? Say, enough said. <laughs> you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. I didn't say you couldn't make anything. Because you carry my image, of course you can make things. Just make sure that when you make something, you don't make it like me. Because you're God-like, because humanity, even in its fallen nature, carries my image, of course humanity is creative. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Whew. How does that fit into our theology? Do we serve a God that's jealous or just a God that loves? Because when you're in love and you see a heart being divided, jealousy rises up. You don't believe me? You don't have to be married. Ask a boyfriend, girlfriend. <laughs> Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So jealousy is not always of the flesh. Jealousy can be a trait of God that arises when he sees a heart that belongs to him. Because the heart cannot serve two masters. Either it will hate one and love the other, or it will despise one and be rejected. You cannot serve two. And since I created the heart, all things are created by me and for me. Because I created the heart, I'm the only one that can prescribe what the heart needs. And the first thing that the heart needs is me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll obey what I command and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. How can I tell if I have made someone or something? How can I discern, how can I distinguish if someone or something is becoming an idol in my life? How can I tell if a person, a place, a thing, an ideal, a goal, a dream. How can I tell if race is becoming an idol? How can I tell if gender is becoming an idol? How can I tell if I'm giving these things the place that only God can have in my life? Three things I want us to think about as we listen. Number one, what is God's purpose for this someone or something? What is God's purpose for this someone or something? What is God's purpose for a person, for a place, for a thing, for an ideal? What is God's purpose for race? What is God's purpose for politics? What is God's purpose for gender? What is God's purpose for vision? What is God's purpose for my natural gifts and my spiritual gifts? Do I see, agree with, and submit to God's purpose for these things first? 
Why or why not? And then finally, what place will I give to these things after I hear this message? Which means, if you're anything like me, it's okay to be guilty, but guilt doesn't have to condemn me. Guilt can reposition me to change. Guilt is a normal function of the conscience. When our conscience is functioning the way that it should, when we get, have you ever noticed that when we get ready to do something before we do anything, if we shouldn't do it, we feel guilty? Mm-hmm. Nobody's told us. <laughs> It's called self-awareness. By the same token, when we do the things that we should do, we feel comfort. Our conscience is a gift from the Lord to protect us without him having to tell us everything. Some things we don't need anybody to tell us. Our conscience testifies to this. I'm getting ready to say something. My conscience says, don't say that. (laughs) If I say it in that moment, I have just elevated that thing to the place of God and it's become an idol. Because it's not the words, it's the spirit behind it. How do I know if it's not an idol? I listen to my conscience. The conscience is interesting because as I listen to my conscience, it continues to be sensitive. But if I choose not to listen to my conscience, then guilt becomes the secondary voice of my conscience that says, let's not keep doing this. If I continue not to listen, then what can happen is I become more and more desensitized. As I become more and more desensitized, watch this. The thing that I normally wouldn't do, I begin to do it a little more freely. Because when I would first do it, Even though I know I shouldn't, watch this. My conscience doesn't just testify to me. My blood pressure goes up. My heart rate increases. Nobody can see this going on on the inside of me. Pitter-pat, 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 pitter-pat. My eyes get big. People are like, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing. (laughs) If I continue to move in that direction... As the voice of my conscience becomes desensitized, now I do it, watch this, and because there's no more guilt, not only do I gain confidence in doing it, but I begin to tell other people it's okay. If I stay in agreement with my conscience, I keep that sensitivity. That restraining power of God works with me. We always want the Lord to be able to restrain us. We do not want the Lord to release us. I always want the Lord to restrain me, but he won't make me. I'll feel the pool. And in the pool, I got to make a choice. Now, what I'm feeling is real. But just because it's real, that doesn't mean it's right. So your conscience is a gift. My conscience is a gift. Sometimes when we have to make decisions, 
We should listen to our conscience. And as we listen to our conscience, we can save ourselves some concern. Does that make sense? God has brought his people out of the nation of Israel. Excuse me, out of the nation of Egypt. He's taken them from Egypt. He's taken them to the promised land. On the way to the promised land, he's trying to develop this relationship. He's revealed himself to Moses. He said, Moses, I'm going to use you to reveal myself through you to this nation of people. I'm going to bring them to Mount Sinai, and when we all get there, I'm going to introduce myself to them. Now, I know that they don't know me. I know that they've been oppressed, and I know that they've been abused. So in Egypt, I'm going to do a lot of signs and wonders to show them how great I am. But when I bring them out, I'm going to move from signs and wonders to intimacy. I'm going to move from doing big things to doing heart things. I'm going to move from just meeting their needs to showing them that I am the biggest need that they have. But I'm going to meet their needs so that when I reveal that I am the greatest need that they have, they will stay in lockstep with me just like when they were receiving their natural needs. And I'm not afraid. to. This is how much confidence that I have. I will tell them who I am. I will tell them what I have done, and then I will say, what God can you create that is who I am and that can do what I did? And if what we create cannot do what he's done, that is the truest indication to us that that is not a God. I am the Lord, your God, who did what? Who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. But I want to define Egypt. Egypt was a place of slavery. It was a place of bondage. It was a place, amen, where your master told you what to do. It was not a place of provision. It was not a good place. It was a a terrible place. It was a place of hurt and pain and abuse. And even though it was generational, it was not normal. Even though it was generational, it was not God. Even though you were there, I've got someplace better. So I want to distinguish myself from what you've been in because I want you not just to receive from my hand, I want you to know me. Because if I can convince you of who I am, then I can use you to be a blessing to other people. Does this make sense? Now this is what Exodus 15 says. And this is what we want to kind of focus on, okay? (laughs) Verse 22. Say, we belong to God. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the people, that is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. Say test. Test. Say it's only a test. test. Say it's only a test. test. Say it's only a test. test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God, say listen. And do what is right in his eyes. Say do. Do. If you pay attention to his commands, say pay attention. attention. And keep all his decrees. Say keep. Keep. I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. Why? For I am the Lord who heals you. 
My will is to heal you, not to hurt you. I don't want to do you like I did the Egyptians. I didn't say I wouldn't. <laughs> I said I don't want to. <laughs> then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. The people have been oppressed. The people have been under Pharaoh. The people have been used and trained and developed in abuse and neglect. The people have seen things that are very traumatic. They have just come out of a time of a great victory. They've just watched the Red Sea close, and with that, Pharaoh and his army has been destroyed. And on the heels of a great victory, there comes a great test. I struggle here because why would God bring a great test after a great victory when I know I need a bunch of great victories? <laughs> Pharaoh was a trip. <laughs> the Egyptians were a trip. The mindset that I bring with me out of Egypt is a trip. They've been testing me and my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather. Our family has been under a test for years. The last thing I'm looking for is a test. I got a test. It's called don't test me. <laughs> I'm fragile. I'm vulnerable. I'm caught up in something I don't understand. Because yeah. if I'm keeping it real, I'm watching all this stuff happen, and I'm like, this is all cray-cray. Right. I've just watched my oppressor be destroyed. I'm seeing this God that I don't know do all of these great big things. And even though I'm happy to be out of Egypt, I don't really know if I want to be holy. I signed up to get free. I signed up to get out the abuse. That's what I signed up for. Anything else, we still negotiate, okay? Anybody ever felt like this? I want to be free from the mental, emotional, physical abuse. But I kind of want to know what it's like to live <laughs> being able to make some of my own choices. So they travel for three days and they don't have any water. Now they probably have drank all their water and their animals have drank all their water too. So it's a pretty serious situation. I'm thirsty. Donkey thirsty, mule thirsty. Bulls thirsty. How many people know we are not in a good mood right now? Because I'm not just thirsty, it's hot, we're in the desert. When I get hot, I get irritable. I know somebody else, when they get hot, they get irritable. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> I'm thirsty. I'm tired. <laughs> and you talking about a test? <laughs> I'm already testy. Some of us, if we don't get our coffee, we acting like they acting. <laughs> Say it's a trip. So why? It's okay if there is no water, right? Because at least I know, well. But then we get to a place where there is water. So you know, you, now we just came out of Egypt. Now let's, let's, let's be real. So we got no sense. 
So when we see water, we running, <laughs> jumping, and lapping. <laughs> We're thirsty. We just came out of Egypt. We just watched Pharaoh die. We don't know this God. It's, it's not like we walked up all prim and proper. No, we all on our knees, dirt everywhere, lapping, lapping, lapping. And at first, we so thirsty, we don't really taste the bitterness till we got about three handfuls. So now I'm really on 10. And since Pastor Moses led us here, I'm coming for his neck. Now, what they said was normal. Verse 24, so the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? What they said wasn't wrong, but the attitude behind what they said was an Egyptian attitude that would kill them in the wilderness if they didn't let it go. They brought an attitude from Egypt with them on the journey. So here's what they were saying. It wasn't just, right, pastor, what are we to drink? No, they were grumbling. The word in Hebrew says they were murmuring. They had a bunch of stuff to say. This is just what's recorded. I'm hot. I'm thirsty. I don't know where the heck I'm at. And I'm following this fool. <laughs> and he got us out here. And now I'm hot, I'm thirsty, my kids, we all gonna die. This is absolutely crazy. I cannot believe, I, and I would go back to Egypt, but the Red Sea might get me too. So I'm really mad. So it wasn't just, what are we to drink? <laughs> test. <laughs> I got a test, all right. Then look at Pastor Moses. Then Pastor Moses cried out to the Lord. They're dogging him out, and he runs to prayer. When people dog us out, do we run to the throne, or do we run to social media? What room do we run into? Watch this, because the room that we run into is the bag that we come out of. <laughs> then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Watch this. In the place of lack, there was also provision. The wood was always there, but when we murmur, when we grumble, when we complain, we can only see lack. He didn't grow the tree. It was always there. But because he went into the right room, he was able to go into the right bag. Some of us keep going into the wrong bag because we keep going into the wrong room. Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit. Listen, the Lord didn't put the wood in the water. The Lord showed him what he needed to do, and then he stepped back to see if his son would model faith. When we pray, we've got to stop praying from an Egyptian place that says, you do it all and I just receive, and we've got to receive strategies from heaven where we are involved in the process. That's faith. And the water became fit to drink. Now watch this. Everybody's happy now, Brother Art. Oh, we lapping it up. <laughs> Drinking all the water we can. And, and listen, when you have an Egyptian mindset, you don't just drink all you can. You pack up all you can. 
They had all their little gas cans. You, you, you ever notice that when gas gets short, you go to the gas station, and, and, and people open up the bed in their truck, and they got like 30 gas cans. And they just taking their sweet little time, right? They got, they pump it in their vehicle, and then they trying to figure out, you like, I'm going to be here for two days. <laughs> Knowing you don't need that much gas. But see, Egypt lies to us. Egypt says, can all you get and get all you can, because we don't know when another situation like this is coming. So they weren't just drinking, they packing up, right? Suitcases full of water. We're not going to be in this place again. They got a Yeti full of water, right? They got it together, right? MK bag full of water, right? Everybody got water. <laughs> and it looks like... <laughs> yeah, I just, I just had to throw that in for my boo, okay? Yeah, that's for my boo, okay? And it looks like we're good. And it looks like it's the end of the story. And when provision becomes an idol, this is the end of the story. Because I'm full. All my little containers are full. God is done talking. See, God is healing a divided heart. Now watch this. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God, which means the real thirst was not for natural water. The real thirst thirst was for the word of the Lord. And just because they received from God's miraculous provision did not mean that they would receive from the word of the Lord. And the problem with this is we were going to get thirsty again in both areas. But if we only want our natural needs being met we will keep receiving, but we'll be like, I wonder, you, you, you ever been dehydrated and no matter how much water you drink, you're like, man, and you just keep go, 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 go. I got myself a brave idea yesterday. And my doctor had told me, you know, to stop doing all this walking and ride my bike. And so I haven't been on my bike in a couple years. So, you know, you know I'm an Iron Man. I'm strong. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kinda, I kind of got myself halfway together, right? So I hopped on my bike, and I said, you know what? I'm going I'm, to I'm ride through the neighborhood, and man, our streets are really bad, okay? <laughs> I'm hitting things, bam, 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 bam. <laughs> and I'm like, so I planned on going a ways. I got around the corner, man, I'm huffing and puffing. I'm like, I'm going to have to go back home. <laughs> But I said, no, no, I'm going to press through it. So I rode through the neighborhood, kind of took my route the way that I go. And then I was coming back home, and a bright idea popped in my head. Ride to the church. And so I said, okay. <laughs> so I'm pedaling. I'm riding down Washington, cars flying by me. <laughs> I'm like, this is scary. I'm looking for the sidewalk. And then I got to Willoughby, and I got by Olivet Baptist Church. I said, I'm turning around. And I'm tired, and I'm doing all this stuff. But then I said, no, man, have some fortitude. Quit being a crybaby, man. Come on, man. And I'm riding down Willoughby, and I finally got here. And I'm tired, and I'm thirsty. And I get off, and I walk up to the doors. Don't have a key. <laughs> Glad I didn't have to use the bathroom, okay? And I look at myself, and I go to say yes, and I got my helmet on backwards. <laughs> I was like, man, I sure got a big head. I'm like, fool, you got your helmet on backwards. So I'm thirsty. Come on, say he's thirsty. 
and I grab my water, and I get ready to drink a bunch, and then I remember I don't have a key. So I said, that's a bad idea. I put that back in. Flip my helmet around. Take a picture, send it to my wife. She called me like, are you serious? She said, you want me to come get you? I was like, yeah. Yes. No, I said no. <laughs> Boo was going to hop in the, in the truck and come get me. I rolled back home, and I just kept drinking water, drinking water, drinking water. And no matter how much I drink, so I'm drinking, drinking, drinking. Because I did something that took a lot more energy than I thought, it was going to take a lot to fill me up. I want to suggest that when provision is our idol instead of God being our idol, we can continue to take in stuff and we can think we're going to be okay. And one area of our life can be full and another area of our life can be lacking. The test was not would God come through. The test is would we be faithful when it doesn't look like he's coming through. What's the first step to faithfulness? Will we still listen? He's curing a divided heart. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, whether you're hot and thirsty and irritated, or whether you're comfortable with the air on and laughing. Will we be consistent in our worship, our faithfulness, and our obedience? If you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees. Now y'all know when they were thirsty, they weren't paying attention to nothing. Moses was Pharaoh. <laughs> Everything was the devil, <laughs> and God doesn't exist. And keep all his decrees. Now, now we, we like to skirt over this because it makes us uncomfortable. Listen to what he said to them corporately. I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. Now, I don't know about y'all. That should have woke everybody up. <laughs> He said, I'm sustaining you, but I will use sickness to get your attention. I'm sustaining you, but I will allow things to happen to get your attention if your heart gets divided. For I am the Lord who heals you. What is God's purpose? For the someone or the something in my life. People, places, things, ideals, politics, race, gender, gifting. Do I see, agree, and submit to God's purpose for these things first? Why or why not? <coughs> what place in my heart or mind do I give to these someone or some things? Sometimes it's not always us that lead ourselves into idolatry. Sometimes other people can lead us into idolatry. Last quick story. God caused Moses to come up on the mountain and be with him. Yes. Moses is up on the mountain. He waits for the Lord to call him in. He doesn't just barrel into the presence because God called him. God is teaching him about procedure and reverence. Yes. Yes. He's up on the mountain. It looks like clouds. The people at the foot of the mountain look up and they see fire. They think, man, the Lord didn't kill Moses. <laughs> He's up there, it looks like cloud. They're down there, it looks like fire. Wow. Yes, yes. 
Moses doesn't say how long he's going to be gone. He just says, when I get back, I'll get back. All of a sudden, they come up with a bright idea. And they come to Aaron and they say, we don't know what happened to Moses. Look like he got burnt up, right? <laughs> no, just keeping it real. They're keeping it in the buck, right? Looking at the fire, God probably did something. We don't know what happened to him. So here's what we want you to do. Make us gods that have brought us up out of Egypt. Because it's interesting, because even in a place of indecision, there's still something in us that wants to worship. Aaron says, bring (laughs) the spoils of Egypt, and he forms a calf. And he brings them to the people and says, here are your gods that have brought you out of Egypt. And the Bible says that they began to worship, but then they ended the night in reverie or sexual immorality. Sometimes if we can protect ourselves from idolatry, we must also protect ourselves from other people's ideas that will lead us into idolatry. It's not just enough for me to protect me. I also got to watch out for other people's ideas that make sense. See, I can be doing good, but then my spouse, my kids, my family members, my brothers and sisters in the kingdom, my friends, then my coworkers. <laughs> See, sometimes we're so busy worried about our coworkers that we exclude the people that really have our heart. And if the people that are close to us are idol worshipers, they have no problem leading us into idolatry. How do I protect myself? How do we protect ourselves? If you, if I, if we listen carefully to the Lord our God and do what is right in his eyes. Expect people who aren't listening to get mad when we listen. Come on, I'm going to take the pressure off everybody, okay? If I'm listening and you're not, that's going to create conflict. It has to. Expect that from them. Don't try to correct them. Don't try to argue with them. Just make a mental note. Now, you know you ain't listening, fool. Get out of here. Now, don't call them that because they'll get offended, right? (laughs) If you listen carefully and do what is right, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, sometimes God is bringing things on people to testify to them and to us. That's why the best way to learn is not through experience. That's the devil is a liar. The best way to learn is for me to watch your experience. <laughs> That's the best way to learn. <laughs> Next time somebody say, don't judge me, say, say I'm not. Say, I'm learning. <laughs> don't judge me. Oh, don't worry about it. Listen, I'm not. I would not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. God's highest level is to heal, not to hurt. But the Lord will allow hurt if it will lead to healing. God wants to heal the divided heart. Does that make sense? Testing is not about promotion as much as it is about drawing close. 
Josiah wants to do more than what they're doing. He's getting older. He's a pretty responsible young man, as far as I know. I have no reason to believe that he's not. He's earning his parents' trust. And as long as he continues to do what he's supposed to, oh yeah, and he does other things without being told, watch this, he doesn't have to ask for more, it's given to him. See, just washing dishes and making beds, that's not going to get you anything. That's the bare minimum. That's what you do because you get fed and you got clothes. You really want more? Start washing windows. Start painting houses, right? Now, that, that, that's the kingdom. And listen, when we're doing it, it seems like really hard work, but then the blessing of more overtakes us, and then we're like, I didn't ask for it. But the heart of the one that can bless says, I know you didn't, but because I see you doing more, I'm going to give you more. But the Egyptian mindset says, let me do bare minimum, but let me get all the blessings. That's Egypt. And if in the natural, a parent will go after that, and there will be conflict, and there will be arguments, and there will be frustration, and there will be complaining, how much more will our Father, which is in heaven? God wants to heal the divided heart. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the grace that you've given us. Thank you for the, pra- the place that you're taking AGK to individually and collectively. We bless you, we honor you, we worship you. Continue to massage our hearts. I stand as one who is guilty, but I'm in the process of growing by God's grace. I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise.